Hey, welcome to the Happy Ramp Podcast. I am Ted Cluck, joined as always in studio by my good friends, my partners in radio, Barnabas Piper and Ron Martin, Ronnie Tarmac, Ronnie Conference, getting back out on the road soon. Um, but we've got him, Piper. We've got him here in studio uh, for a moment, for a fleeting moment. Yeah, he was uh, really gracious to give us some time between between travels and, and Instagram welcome, and Yoda tweeting. Don't just mention it. Squeezing us in. Don't Really Maybe. gracious. Don't mention it. Yeah, okay. So just to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. A little setup. Uh, we are doing this format where each host, each co-host of the Happy Rant gets their own episode to be interviewed, uh, to be questioned. And uh, Ronald is... Uh, the star today, he's, he's always the star, really, but he's the he's the star of today's episode uh, in which Piper and I will will come at him with questions. And this this isn't so much a formal question, baby, as, as just a kind of a thing that we always do. But how's the, how's the Yoda life been lately? You know, it's been uh, you know, I haven't been I've been devoting a lot of time to it. I, I've been uh, I'm like you, T. I've been been uh, battling through some some glumminess. Yeah. And uh, when I'm glum, I, I don't I, uh, I kind of back off of the. Uh, the social media a little bit. I just I don't have a lot of inspiration there for uh, for getting out there. So yeah, so I've been a little little distant from it. Yeah. You know? so, so okay, yeah. so I want to I want to use that as a bridge to my first question. Um, when you are glum, and this is speaking as another glum person, um, how how honest are you with people about that? And your your livelihood, my livelihood, both depend on being around a lot of people. Um, for me and probably also for you, there's a sense of, okay, I really need to deliver what these people want. Um, I need to give them an experience. I need to be entertaining or engaging or whatever the situation calls for. Um, how honest are you about your glumness and what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I I think it's weird. It gets kind of masked, I think in some ways. So Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think when, I think when somebody's getting me at my most, Oh, I don't know. Probably like sarcastic and, uh, you know, almost kind of cynical, but doing it in more of like a funny ha ha way. I, th- mm-hmm. I think, I think they're getting some of that, a little bit of that depressed big yeah. R. Yeah. And then I think, um, I think when they're getting a little more of that pouring out groaning and complaining, I think they're getting my level of anxiety. I've probably had more anxiety the mm-hmm. last month and I've had like, you know, glumminess, but yeah. anxiety produces a sense of, of glumness, you know? <clears throat> Absolutely. And, um, but I think, yeah, I think when I'm super anxious, um, and that's sort of, that's tipping the scales on me, then I, I, I do, I tend to, depending on the person, I, I tend to, I, I can overshare at times, mm-hmm. but it's very, but it's very select, you mm-hmm. know? And, um, so I, man, I don't know that that's, it's a hard question to answer in some ways because, um, I'm always, I'm always aware. I'm always taking my emotional temperature as a, as an Enneagram four, you know, I'm always, I always know how I feel at every minute of every day. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of how I'm wired, unfortunately. And, um, mm-hmm. so I'm always aware of, I'm always trying to be aware of how I'm coming off to people. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm guarded, but that can also kind of turn me into somebody who's, who's putting off a, a persona as Piper has accused me of many times. And, mm-hmm. um, so it's not I, an I, accusation, it's a diagnosis. I, yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think I don't think it's accusatory. I think I think you're actually right. And um, mm-hmm. so. Um, so, yeah, I think it's I think it's a mixed bag. So what that means then at the end to answer your question really directly is, yeah, is um, people are getting different versions of me. So where mm-hmm. well, this person is like if, if one person were to describe me to another person, they might go, dude, I don't know who you're talking about right now. Yeah. And, and so it's a little chameleon like for me in, in those ways, I think. Okay, I have a follow up, and I, I don't want to hijack this whole interview from Pipe because he has good questions locked and loaded too. But as I, I think you and I are wired in a, in a lot of the same ways, Ronald. And as someone who is a four, who's taking their emotional temperature, who battles, you know, some anxiety, some glum, glumness at times, um, and be, being married to a wife who isn't wired like that, I don't think Melissa is wired in the same way. KK, yeah, not at all. Yeah. Does your wife get sick of your constant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What does that look like? <laughs> and as you can Next tell, question, my, boys. my Next interest question. in this question, like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Because like, I think my, my wife is great and she's gracious and she's got a, a large capacity for, for that from me. But, but then we hit this point and it's very mm-hmm. distinct mm-hmm. when she's done and she's yeah. just sick of it. Um, 
does does that happen for you guys? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, it's been a massive it's been a massive navigation for us through the years. I think as we've gotten older and we've been able to, I think, kind of see it a little more clearly, like what's happening, when it's happening, and then just understanding the way each of us are wired a little more clearly. I mean, we're still learning, growing in that, but we we definitely have a better grasp on it now than we did ten years ago or twenty years ago. And um, I think, yeah, I think I think it's been better. But yeah, she, so so Big M is an Enneagram five, which means she, you know, she she processes cerebrally, and she um, she's an introvert. So and she has a very small tank as an introvert. Um, mm-hmm. So she gets exhausted very, you know, very quickly uh, in groups of people, and and I can be like groups of people at times mm-hmm. because I'm I'm emotional and I can be intense and I can be dramatic. Mainly, I'm just dramatic, and um, so I would say this kind of like double K. I mean, God gave me this woman that is just somehow like her tank for other things is small. Her tank for me is massive. Mm-hmm. And um, and I've never been able to figure that one out other than I'm super pumped that it is. And I'm super grateful yeah. for it. But yeah, but there are times when she doesn't have a, a large tank for me. And I've been better at sort of like seeing that. So if I'm in a particular mood, whether it's anxiety or just feeling, you know, just generally glum, I mean, I I can really sense where she's at um, because I'm a verbal processor. I got to get it out of me through processing with my mouth. In fact, I have to, it helps me think clearly. Talking is how I get to my thoughts, the clarity of my thoughts. And that's not her. She has to think, she needs to get into a corner alone and think. And so, but she also recognizes that I need to like verbally process. So she's been amazing in terms of allowing me to express myself that way. But there are times when she's like, baby, I don't got it. I don't got it today. And I just go, yeah, absolutely. Um, But she comes back and she'll say, hey, why don't we revisit that thing? Um, That was, maybe you've had more time to think about it. And what's so crazy is every time we do that, um, I'm a guy that needs to process too internally. And every time we do that, I verbally process better than I would have if it would have just been in the moment, right? Mm. And so I don't, it's really interesting. It's like, it's a dynamic, right? It's, it's a, it really is like a storyline in some mm. ways where you're, where it's like, okay, how is this working out for us today, tomorrow, and then through the, through the years? And I just think it's, it's been better, but it's, it, there are moments when it is massively challenging for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. no, I get it. Definitely get it. Pipe, what do you got? Well, uh, the conversation about how you interact with your wife sets up my first question, which is uh, we've heard how, you know, Ted has told some of his story on previous podcasts about how he met his wife. I don't have any idea how you met Big M. I would like to know that. And I think our listeners would, too. Yeah. So I met Big M at this big, massive mega church that we attended. We didn't know each other when we were attending it. We were, you know, we're five years apart. So her friends group was a little different than my friends group, right? I was a little further along than her, obviously. And uh, so we both knew this usher that was there. For, they had these Sunday night services. This was back in the day where you had the big Sunday night service. It was a little more cash. They would have like a, they would have like a, you know, like a, you know, a CCM artist come in and, and do their thing. And so we obviously, you know, would, would go to this service. Um, we both knew this usher that I would hang out with for half the service. Cause that's what you did. And, um, and so I just met her one day. She just came in. They handed her the bulletin. I, you know, I, I, I had seen her around. He introduced me to her. And, um, you know, I, I was, you know, I thought she was cute. Somebody I would have liked to have gotten to know, but we were just, it, it wasn't the time. Right. And so I saw her for the next couple of years. I would just see her kind of coming in and out of church. And some of these friends groups we had would overlap on just on rare occasion. And I would see her and I would always think, man, I, I, I would love to, uh, you know, I'd love to just even get a minute with her. And I was, I was just, you know, I was real shy back then in the sense that I, I didn't push myself. I didn't get myself out there in those ways. And so I just, I just kind of hung back. I was in other relationships at the time. And then this weirdo thing happened one night where, um, man, we were going to this concert in Newport beach, which was about a half an hour. Um, it was this coffee shop on the coast. We had some friends that were playing and, um, it's kind of funny because, you know, we were we were getting ready to go, me, my little brother and our friends. And I wasn't even going to go. I was tired. I didn't feel like going. They're all in the car. They literally pull out of the driveway. They take off. And I said, oh, man, what else am I going to do tonight? So I just I run out of the house down the street to stop them. And I say, hey, hold on. Let me just grab my let me just grab my hoodie and I'll, I'll hop in with you and I'll go. So I do that. I get there and she's there with her friend who I happen to know just a little bit better than her. But she's there. And I'm like just coming out of relationship that wasn't significant, but I was just feeling tired. And sometimes when you're tired, 
you start feeling a little more bold. And so I literally just went up to her and, you know, we, we knew each other. We knew each other's name, but that was about it. I said, hey, um, you know, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Man, I'd love to, uh, you know, I'd love to chat if, if that sounds cool. And she literally just said, uh, no, that's OK. Um, and I looked at her and I looked at her friend. Her friend looked at me and her eyes got all big, you know, and I went, all right. And so anyway, we, 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 we continued chatting that night. And, um, and I just got such a stand offy like vibe from her and, um, which again, wasn't shocking or anything, but it was just like, all right. So then, uh, so long story short, we're, we're on our way home. One of the dudes that was driving with us knew her really well. And I didn't know that had her phone number and everything. And I was like, dude, just get, would you mind giving, you know, this is back in the day, right? It sounds weird, but back in the day, you know, you would get other, you would get people's phone numbers from friends and it wasn't like a weird thing to get a call from somebody. And, and, um, you know, it was before, like, you know, it was before all the stalker stuff, you know, that we, we have a, a culture around now was, was a thing. And so I got her phone number. I just said, you know what, man, I'm getting old. I don't know how old I was. You know, I'm in my early twenties. I'm like, I got to make a move. So I call her, we talk, everything was great. I'm like, man, it was so different than talking to her there. She seems enthusiastic. And, um, and, and I said, well, Hey, can I give you a call again? She said, yeah, absolutely. So everything's good. I call, I wait a week. I wait six days, right, Big T? You know where I'm going six with days. this. Yeah, I, wait I knew six where you were going with this, baby. And uh, so I call her in six days, right? Yeah. And her uh, her dad answers the phone, and uh, she's not there. Mm-hmm. So I leave a message, and um, and, I, and I'm kind of nervous at that point because, you know, when you leave the message with the, with the old man, you're not sure it's going to get to her, right? Yeah. And uh, so I leave the message. Um, a week goes by, nothing. Uh. Two weeks goes by, zip. Maybe. Three weeks goes by and I'm like, I gave it a shot. I actually felt yeah. good because I gave it a shot, right? Yeah. And uh, and I'm like, well, at least I tried. Man, that was, was kind of bold for me. I, you know, I made a I made a cold call, you know, on this yeah. chick and you know all that stuff. And then so a month later, man, I get a call like on a Monday night from Big M. All yeah. right. And uh, so dude, here, her friends uh, were telling her to wait six days. No, dude. So this is what happened, man. It's the craziest thing, right? So again, I knew her friend and her sister better than her, right? Yeah. And so, um, so she goes, okay, she goes, I got to tell you a story. And I said, all right, I'm here for it. And, uh, so she said, so, um, I, my dad told me you called, but he, he didn't, he lost like the, she lost the number that he wrote down. And, um, I said, well, that's convenient. Maybe we can talk yeah. about that later. Right. Yeah. Um, he, but, yeah, uh, he, he lost it in the garbage can. He's like, yeah. well, that's <laughs> exactly. It wasn't gone. a lie. Yeah. He intentionally lost it. So she said, so I, so I grabbed my sister's phone book. These were these books that you had back in the day, yeah. you know, phone numbers in. And she said, and, cause I knew she had your number. And so I found the number I called and I, for the last three weeks, I've been talking to this guy named Ronnie. That isn't, that wasn't you, man. And ah. she said, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best story. And he was awesome. <laughs> so she said, so this is what happens, right? So she's on her third phone call in three weeks with this guy. Uh-huh. And, um, and this was making me feel good, right? Because she kept calling him back. Yeah. And, um, and she's like, it finally gets to this place where I go, I, I f- I'm talking to him. I'm like, hey, are you okay? You, you seem, you seem kind of strange. Like, are you, is everything all right? And he goes, no, I'm, I'm fine. And, and I go, well, you just seem odd. And he goes, you know, I go, he goes, I'm, I, I'm fine. I go, I just don't know why you've been calling me. And I've been, a, I don't want to be rude, but like, <laughs> why have you been calling me? Like, I never, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know that we've even met more than like one time. And she goes, well, I mean, you were the one that called me first. Um, so I was just kind of calling you back because you seemed like you wanted to talk. And he goes, I've never called you. And she goes, what's your name? And he goes, Ronnie Smith. Oh, it's, Ronnie it's, Smith. Oh, Smitty. Yeah. She goes, I'm so sorry. I've been talking to the wrong dude for like three weeks. So she tells me the story. It breaks the ice. Mm. It, I mean, the whole thing, it was just this massive ha ha moment. I yeah. asked her out literally five days later. It's a Saturday night. We're out. We're having a great time. And the rest, as they say, 10 months later, we're married. So that was the story. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> well, Thanks for. I'm glad. I'm glad Ronnie Smith didn't completely ruin things for you. No man. Maybe Ronnie whatever. What, whatever happened to Ronnie Smith? I don't know. I don't even know who Ronnie Smith is. Seriously. I feel like I don't. I feel like it's rare, Piper, to know in your personal sphere two guys who go by Ronnie. You know what I mean? Like I, like a Ron I only and a Ronnie. Know one. I know. That's that's no, what that's I'm not saying. True. I know. I know another one, but uh, 
yeah, it's they live in very separate states, and it's yeah, not in like the personal who's in my sister's phone book sphere. It's yeah. a weird. It's a, like it's a you know this is what I've always said, boys. It's like it's a super common, but like. It's a common name that you don't hear a lot for some reason. I think it's an, of another era. But like yeah. since I've lived in a town, I've literally met I think three Rons in this town, which is yeah, really dude. You true. get you get some Rons in the Midwest for sure, yeah. but not a lot of Ronnies. Um, yeah, and that was just apparent. I mean, they just always called me Ron. Ron yeah. never stuck with anybody, so it was always just Ron. That's all that yeah. is. But yeah. Did yeah, you ever so consider it. like at any point in your burgeoning adult life like a pivot into Ron? Because I, I feel like. A lot of college kids do this. Like they'll experiment with like making their name have a little more gravitas. Dude, you know, you know what's so funny, man? I just yeah. I don't really enjoy that name. I, I had yeah. one guy. I had a really enduring kind of friend in my life, and he's the only guy that called me Ron. Besides you guys, and you guys just yeah. do funny. But like, he literally called me Ron, and he never thought anything of it, and I never corrected. I just didn't care. I yeah. really don't care. But like, sure. it just it's a name that never stuck, and it's a name that feels way different to me than Ronnie. Like Ronnie is Ronnie. And then that's what I was called my whole life. But Ron feels like this completely different name to me. Yeah. It just feels kind of foreign to me. So yeah. It's, it's never stuck with anybody. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's that's good. I get it. Um, baby, what's the last movie you watched? Oh, man. Uh, like the last one, just chronologically. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Dude, these questions always stump me. What did we just watch? Um, like in the theater? Like that? No, no. Or like at home. Oh, like, like at home. N- nobody has watched a movie in the theater in 14 years. Yeah, sorry. Right. That's right, right, just right. COVID has erased all memory of movie theaters. If you go to the theater, you're a monster and a murderer. You might as well. I think uh, it was. Uh, I, I I watched this old 60s movie called A Summer Place that I watch every summer. So I watched that like last no week. No kidding. Tell yeah. me about A Summer Place. It's uh, with Troy Donahue and uh, Sandra D. Just okay. old school classic beach kind of romance, kind of scandalous for the time, kind of yeah. post James Dean. Like we're getting, we're getting all existential in our movie making now yeah, and we're yeah. bringing in like topics that are, that are like making parents angry and nervous. And it was like one of those coming of, you yeah. know, kind of movies of that era, but it's really, it's just, it's been one of our, like in, me and big M's, one of our enduring, like uh, classics, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Do you miss the beach, baby? You miss the water? Um, so I grew up close to the beach. Um, I was never a beach guy, uh, uh-huh. never surfed. Um, yeah. so leaving the beach wasn't, it, it wasn't like a big, it wasn't like a tearful goodbye, but I'm telling you, man, I mean, since being in the Midwest for the last 10 years, I, 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 I certainly miss it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I miss the access to it. Yeah. So we weren't guys that were at the beach every day, but it, just having it there and having it close yeah, um, it was really kind of a cathartic thing that we ended up doing in terms of just man, just getting onto the sand and just, you know, reading a book and just letting the waves kind of kind of, you know, produce some kind of, a, a, I don't know, so just just give you some clarity and, and mm-hmm. let everything kind of wash off you a little bit. And uh, so yeah. I definitely miss it for that, because there's really other than, you know, we, we kind of do a lot of trail hiking and kind of getting into some of the, you know, getting into some of that with the trees and kind of the beauty. But that's that's kind of our version of it here in, in Ojai. And, uh, but yeah, it, there's nothing like, there's nothing like the water in the sand. I mean, it just is what it is. It's just, a, it's a, um, you know, if you've grown up around it, um, you just, it, it kind of becomes something that you, uh, you become accustomed to. And so yeah. I didn't think I would miss it as much as I did because I never was like quote unquote beach guy, but, but I actually mm-hmm. do, I think. Yeah. I have a question for you. Speaking of beaches and the Midwest. How in the world did you go from California, and obviously you were a touring artist for a good while, but then planting a church in Ashland, Ohio, that's, uh, especially when it was a like, small town church planting was not really a thing. That wasn't a thing that people did when you started that. That was not cool. So what, what happened? So what we went just, off the rails or, or, or what redirected that train? Yeah, well, it's everything, man. It's all those things. So we were, I was on staff at a church in, uh, in SoCal. And uh, God was kind of moving us off the road um, into minute more ministry stuff that was just happening sort of organically and um, kind of come to the end of some of the contract I had with Tooth and Nail Records. And, uh, you know, some of those things were just were just happening. You know, I was getting older and all of that. And so we uh, we were still we were still playing weekend shows. So we were still doing these things that, that we call fly outs, right, where you go, you play a couple shows in a particular region and you fly the band in to sort of a centralized area and then you kind of drive out, play three or four shows. 
And um, and these, you know, man, in the in the Christian industry, you play shows everywhere, right? So it's not you're not only playing major cities, but you're playing a lot of small towns and churches and coffee houses and all that. And we just happened to play a show at a church in Ashland and um, at a bigger church, which you know was pretty common for us. And it just so happened they were looking for a music guy, and the 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 promoter, the person that booked the show. Um, she just happened to be a big fan and she kind of knew what I was doing now. I was, that's, that was my role at the church I was at and just said, Hey, you know, we're looking for this position. And I know you've talked a lot about, you know, in interviews and all that, you know, relocating out of California. And I, and I always did, I always talked about moving to a place like Ohio or Pennsylvania because the beauty and just, you know, it's about a quarter of the price to live and, you know, all of those things. And so we just kind of pursued it. We kind of just opened our eyes to it, prayed about it. And one thing led to another. And we actually, you know, we actually were, this church wanted to bring us on. And so we just kind of took this massive step and uh, relocated uh, again, 10 years ago to this, to this church. And I think what I didn't know at the time, which, you know, which was kind of interesting was that God always kind of put me in the company of church planters. And for some reason, these were always the guys, even at the church I was at, these were the guys that were always drawn to me, right? Because I was kind of entrepreneurial and, and um, the, I always found, you know, kind of my best friends in these guys and just always was fascinated the way they talked about church planning and had no desire for it at all. Um, but just was always fascinated, always was just listening just for hours, them just going on and on because church planners go on and on about these things. It's kind of like the way pastors go on and on about everything they do. They Dude, why do they go on and on? Why because they just that? think what they do is the most interesting thing in the world. And it's not, but they think it is. Dude, why do they think that? Is is it something like baked into their personalities or is it, and I'm going somewhere with this. No, is you're it, going somewhere and I have an answer. I have, It's a rabbit, but I have an answer for that. No, no, no. I want to hear it because it's, yeah. it's kind of fascinating because they do. They go on and on and on. And I've seen this too. So like, is it because they think their thing is the most interesting or is it because they live in such a kind of small world that, that it feels more interesting than it is. I think it's the latter. And I think that most pastors are there. They haven't grown a lot in emotional EQ. There's a social awkwardness with the majority of pastors given their vocation. And the fact that they mainly listen and they sit yeah. down with people and they're listening and they're listening and they, they lack opportunity to sort of let it all out. Yeah. And so when they get around somebody who asks questions and says, Hey, tell me what it is that you're thinking, dreaming and planning on doing. Dude, these guys just, they throw up. Right. And so, and I think, I, I mean, you know, I've done the same thing. And so I, like, I understand, so it's not a criticism. I think it's just a reality of, of the role, right. For a lot of these guys. And when they get around somebody that even has a bit of an interest or understanding of what they're doing, it's just, it's like Christmas. It's like Christmas time. Right. It's like, Oh my gosh. You know, because you know, I mean, people in their congregation generally aren't, you say church planning, you even have to explain what that term means, right? And right. Uh, so I think there is a sense of that. And so I was always around these guys and I always liked, I actually liked hearing about what they were doing, right? Because I, I like entrepreneurial things and it fascinated me. Yeah. And so when we moved to uh, A-Town, sure enough, man, I mean, God just put me around all these guys. I got connected in Columbus with one of these gospel coalition chapters, a local chapter, all church planners. And these guys would just start saying things to me like this, like, so when are you going to plant, Ronnie? And I said, like, never, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so but there was that, it was almost like a weird pressure that started getting applied to me. And because of that, and because it kept just kind of just kind of coming at me from every angle, we started praying about it. And I kind of had a real big desire to start, you know, to do more preaching and teaching anyway. So that was already something that, that was a piece that was already in there. And then planting, I think, just came as a result of being around so many planters, learning so much about it without having d done it to where at some point, you know, after a lot of prayer and consideration and just craziness and messiness, we ended up just diving into it uh, in, in the town that we moved to. We really saw a need for the kind of church that we wanted to plant here, yeah. uh, which, of course, is substance. And um, and yeah, so it, it just it was just a, it was a disaster in the making and God kind of blessed it. And, and here we are, you know. Dude, so I have a I have a follow up on that, man, and and it, again, like like Pipe said with me an episode ago, get as personal and detailed or not personal and detailed as you want. But like, do you think do you think the kind of people who are drawn to church planting, do you think they're starters? They're the kind of people who love starting things, right? And that's the entrepreneurial type. But do you think they have trouble finishing? You know what I mean? Do you think they have trouble sticking around? Yeah. Um, for sure. Does I it, think. does it draw a certain kind of person? I think it draws both of those types. So I think, uh, you know, I think, um, 
I think the starters are the guys that are able to get generate something quickly because they care about they love the building process. They love the yeah. dreaming process. They yeah. love the aesthetic aspect of it. Right. They love the idea of, of, you know, creating something from scratch. Yeah. Um, and so they, they, they can get things to places where everybody else is looking and they're saying, well, how did you do that? But I think they really struggle with the ensuing years, right? Where it is, you know, growing a congregation, pastoring a congregation, maintaining, you know, your values and your mission and all of those things. So, yeah, I think there's that type. I'd probably lean more on that side of it. Mm-hmm. And then there's this other type that is more of the, of the latter. And so they have a really hard time They They might or might not be planters, quote unquote. They, they probably do really well to have a really well-established team around them. Right. And yeah. so they, they, they take a long time to get to the place that a, a more of a starter guy gets to quickly, but they also have the ability to kind of stick it out and not be looking at what's next. And I think in the end, those guys, I don't know, they might be the more effective planters you know they just have a, a harder time kind of getting it off the ground um and and then the starters are just they're just look they just want to go do something they're just always looking for something new and um so i don't know i you know I've, i'm definitely more of the former because of i like to start things and i've started a lot of things in my life and there's yeah. i like something new it's like when you write a new book I, I love i love the idea of the new book i love the introduction in the first chapter way more than i like the process of sure. writing a book I love sure. thinking about it. I love dreaming up the title. And, uh, you know, I love mm-hmm. I love all that aspect of it. you get me into chapter five. And I'm like, man, if I could just get somebody to ghostwrite this thing for me, that would be aces. You know? Yeah, no and, doubt. Uh, so that's kind of more how I'm mm-hmm. wired for sure. Yeah. yeah. Dude, do you I, think oh, along those lines, do you think that's a this is going to sound harsh, but it, it isn't. And I'm curious for myself. Do you think it's a spiritual deficiency at some level, like being a starter and using starting as a way to stave off like the emotional entanglements of being in something for a long time. You know what I mean? I th- Cause I, I think yeah. for a long time and, and this worked out okay being a freelance writer, like I, I was always chasing the next thing. And just as the thing that I was doing started to go South, like I, I would, I would be able to like prop myself up with a new thing. You know what I mean? But yeah. I think as I get older and I see the value of sticking around more, I don't know, the entanglements are challenging, uh, but I'm not necessarily compelled anymore to go chase something new because I know that the entanglements will be the same over there. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think that's just called wisdom. I think the other thing, too, is that like even if you're somebody that loves the start, you have to you have to develop endurance no matter what yeah. you do. And yeah. I think that starters are much less prone towards endurance. Um, so I think that there's, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, I'm really a believer that God has like wired everybody a particular way. And, um, and I think we fight against that because we've sort of adopted particular either cultural or, you know, ministerial norms. Uh And so I just, I don't, I think some guys are better suited, um, to being on the ground and generating things. And I think there are other guys that are just more suited, uh, you know, for, um, you know, kind of, kind of being more long haulers. And I think, yeah. um, both, both of that requires, both of those have a deficiency in some areas that need to be developed for sure. Mm-hmm. But, um, I think, you know, I think each of the, if, if you're able to find a lane in each of those two things that, that allows for some endurance, I think, um, I think it's a good thing. I think both are super necessary. I, I any, everything has a deficiency, right. But I think to ignore, sort of that, um, that initial wiring that God has given you. I mean, man, some people hate new, th- like my wife does not like starting new things. Mm. She doesn't even, you know, she, she loves having something that is, that is time tested and well-worn. And yeah. I'm like, man, the minute, the minute we've had that couch for like 12 months, I just meant it's super exciting for me to say, Hey, let's go, let's go buy something new today. Let's get uh-huh. something. new. I just like that. I like new yeah. things. Yeah. And, um, so again, that can, that can lean over into something unhealthy um, it can also be something that does some good in, in the particular sphere that you're in. But again, it's just sanctification that makes those things more balanced, I think. Yeah. So I think as I've gotten older and, you know, 1.9% more sanctified, it, it, it's, mm. ah, it's just gotten better, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good, man. That's a good word. <laughs> Piper, we got to get the, we got to get the I, baby I, boy I, onto the road soon, but do you have one more? I, I have two quick questions and I, yeah, think no, we're good. I think they're both quick. One is, uh, do you still consider yourself a church planter, even though you 
Like, at what point do you shift from church planter to I'm a pastor? Like, this is the church that I pastor. I think that is, that's probably one of the greatest questions ever, Pipe. I think, um, I, I'm an, I would, I call myself like more of an accidental church planner. I don't, I lack a lot of the, um, the qualities of a, of your, of your really good, solid, all in, like dreaming about it night and day has already written like 41 white papers on how to best church plant church planner. Right. I mean, that's, that's just not who I am. So God, God used a couple of, of, I think maybe strengths or giftings. And, and, and this is going to sound self-deprecating. I don't mean it to, but I don't really have like the general sort of like strength finders qualities of like a, of a church planner. I think God was just super gracious in how he's like started this and grown this. But yeah, I just, it's hard for me to even identify as that, that guy because I've never really felt like I'm that great at it. And I, my heart doesn't beat for church. I mean, we've planted two churches. So like it's, there's something in the, there's something there's something in sort of the mechanics of it that I enjoy, but in terms of it, I don't know, in terms of something that I'd want to keep doing at the level that I've been doing at is, is not there. And so I, when I, I think, I think my head shifted way more into pastor and way quicker out of church planter. Um, and yet those things overlap. Right. And so I, I don't know how to make a distinction between those two things, except I feel like kind of an imposter in terms of, of a church planner. I mean, you know, I feel like an imposter of a pastor too. Everybody does, we all do, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, but the church planning thing, people, you know, people ask me questions about it or they want to talk about it. And I love talking about it, you know, because that's what we just covered a minute ago. But at the same time, it's like, oh man, it's like, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to be writing like a, a book on, on, you know, on how to church plant, you know? Um, it's just, I feel, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but. Uh, gotcha. I just, I, I think there's something, I think there are guys who insist on calling themselves church planters because it, it has a kind of a, an edginess or a cool factor to it. Like if you're a pastor, you're just one of hundreds of thousands of people who may or may not be good at their job. If you're a church planter, it's sort of like, like you could be in the army or you could be special forces. You know, totally. one of those is just a, a little bit, one is just, just a little bit more bad A than the other. And I here's think another a, distinction. A that. Pastors do meetings in their office. Church planters do meetings at like, coffee shops or pubs totally that's i don't know i don't like the see this is that's the thing though man is like i don't i this is i mean this is going to sound confusing but like just the the aspect that like more established more wisdom filled pastors might look at a church planter and just say oh you know those those kids or those radicals i don't want to be in that group you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like that doesn't that's not something that I don't, I don't feel good about being in a group that sort of gets pushed off to the side, mm-hmm. you know, into, into the 2% and, yeah. and isn't taken seriously. Like yeah. I would, I would super, like, I would, I would want to say that I never planted a church before in my life. If that's how somebody's <laughs> going to perceive, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and it kind of, it bothered me the same way when I was leading worship all those years, it's yeah. like the worship leader is just the guy that everybody just goes, Oh, you know what? It doesn't matter what he says. We don't care about yeah. what he thinks. And like yeah. that drove me up the wall. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it was like, well, I mean, are you saying I don't like I don't have an opinion on this? Why? Because I because I because I sing on Sundays instead of preach. And so that was like that was something that was a massive thing I had to overcome because it felt like, you know, it felt a little uh, dismissive. Yeah. And, and I would yeah. I would super struggle with being dismissed because, you know, I'm either a planter or I'm like a worship guy or, you know, like, be you know, we'll put you over in this corner or this specialized group. And, um, I, man, that's a massive, that's a massive barrier for me. So there's a little vulnerability for you boys. All right, one, one more, one more final question. Your church has gotten a lot of pub on this podcast. Uh, we, we talk about your role in it often. How did you pick the name substance church? Cause to me being a cynic, it sounds a little bit like a subtweet of the non-substantial churches in your area. Yeah, I mean, so the the fu- funny thing about names, pipe, is you know every name you it you know it kind of you choose a name, it passes the two week test, which means it's finally the one name that you didn't like dismiss ten minutes after you chose it, and then two weeks later it's the name, three weeks later um, nobody cares anymore, and then four weeks later you wish to gosh that you would have picked a different name, right? And um, so I I think the name, yeah. So my my favorite album of all time is uh is by a band called new order and the and it was a greatest hits record that dropped in the 80s called substance right and they they used that word a lot so i think in my consciousness that word just kind of was always there i liked that i liked that word 
And um, and yeah, I think it probably. I don't think that ever came up about hey, we want to be the the church that that is you know we're the church that's preaching the gospel. We're we're the church that has substance. I don't think we meant it in a snobby way, although some people probably took it to to mean that. And um, I you know here's I mean here's a secret, right? I I think that you know all these names that that have become popular over the last like ten years like substance. I I don't know that they have legs. We're probably going to have to do a name change here at some point. But um, they, they feel of a particular era, which bothers me about the name in and of itself. And I, I certainly don't know if I pick the name now um, because I'm, I'm, I'm older and I would probably want something a little less just that, you know, that kind of a name. Right. But, yeah, I think I think it was just I, I think cons- I think one of the things that did come up um, with this core team that we had when I suggested the name and everybody just liked the name. So that was part of it. But I think it was um, it was a word that came up a lot when we were talking about our values and our mission. You know, well, what is the substance of what we're trying to be here? And that kept coming up. And I think, um, you know, I, I think it's just I think it's one of those things where in in this particular town where most of the churches are called like First Baptist or, you know, United Methodist. It's it's one of the, it's really one of the only churches in town that doesn't have one of those uber traditional names. And so it right. kind of popped a little bit, too, in the town. And that makes uh, sense. Yeah. So I think that was part of it, too. Like it'll it'll you know, it, it will kind of rise above just sort of the traditionalism of the town. I think that was it. But yeah. But then, you know, you, you get older and you look at those names like First Baptist or Second United, whatever. And you kind of go, oh, I don't know. I kind of like those names at the same time. I'm you know, I, I mean, I think we're all getting a little tired of, of you know, uh, this, you know, you know, Redemption Church, which, is, you know, everybody's naming their church, you know. So all these names just start getting like cycled through and everything gets tiring after a while. And, you know, shoot, I, you know, I'm, so a, I'm a starter. I wish we could have a new name every year. Right. I have a, I, let, let me throw a suggestion in the ring. Uh, non non ironical suggestion. I think the church names that hold up best are location. They're low because because. The church is out yeah. of place. So, yeah, you know, yeah. third app, Ave- third Avenue church or the church at whatever place. Cause if you just, you know, like whatever district of town you're in, if it has like a, you know, it's like old town church or whatever, those, those kind of things hold up cause neighborhoods, city street names, whatever. And, uh, and you can do it without adding a denomination or a label that might be polarizing type. I love it. I mean, I totally agree. We've actually talked about the old, like, Hey, South street church, you know, old town church, uh, the church yeah, at I, the strip mall. Yeah, absolutely. Even better. I mean, I like those names are, uh, Quiznos I, I Avenue. Have legs. First Baptist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I love it. I love it because it's like, you know, we don't have to be artistic with our name. We can be, I, you know, there's no rules for any of this stuff, but, um, but a name does say something about you. And I think what I've always brought up is like, it's kind of like anything else we do, right? It brands us. Everything we do is a branding tool. And it's like, does, does it say something about us? That's been a negative in the town. Are we, you know, we had some guy. so some guy came in a while back, he's become a really cool dude, a member of the church. And he came in and he goes, he goes, gosh, you guys aren't anything like I was told. And I said, oh, dude, and I love it when people say that, right? Because I go, oh, <laughs> I said, what were you told? And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, I, t- I was told, he said, I was told that you guys are the super liberal church and the, the, where the dude with the pastor who wears skinny jeans, right? And this was a couple of years ago, right? And I and I said, I said, well, I go, that's interesting. I go, well, what do you think now? Like, how would you describe us now? And he goes, well, he goes, I, I feel like, I feel like you guys couldn't be more conservative, like in your theology. He goes, so that was that was so weird to me. He goes, I think he was just saying that because you guys meet in a warehouse and you do, you know you dress casual. And I said, right. I said, I said, and the irony is that we probably are more conservative than the than the guy's church. You like leveled that at us. I go, which is interesting, right? He goes, exactly. He goes, I came back and I told him that, and he was just floored. He was floored at that, you know. And so it's really interesting, like perception. So the name probably has given us that perception, which I wouldn't want us to have. But um, so it's kind of made us think, like, I don't know, man. Do we do we swap it out? You know, who knows? Big questions. Big, Big question. Yeah, lots, lots on the horizon. Lots on the horizon. You know, baby, why do you pretend to not listen to the podcast? I've why never listened. Important? I've never listened to an episode. I don't believe two. you. I promise I you, you, I have never listened to an episode <laughs> of the rant. Lies. I promise. Why? Why I, is that a core value? Why would I listen to something we've recorded? I don't know. Well, why, why not listen to the ones that Ted and I record that you're not on? I just don't listen to podcasts at all. 
So I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I just, I can't, you know, here it is, boys. And I'm going to be, that's vulnerable. the most legitimate answer I've heard yet, Piper. That one I kind of almost believe. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I can, there's just no reason I can to at least give him a pass for that one. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I just, I, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I hate the sound of my own voice. So whenever I listen to something that I've recorded, it makes me never want to record again. So I feel like the less I do that, the more I'll keep recording. Don't you feel like that every time we record this podcast, though? I never want to record another thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've, yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, I always think that, right? But that's, yeah, that's a whole, that's, that's boys, it's separate. tough to walk away from money like this, though. Well, that's what I'm you saying. Know? I mean, it's, I just feel like it would be irresponsible. It's, it's all of that. You know, once you've, once you've walked down the red carpet, how do you mm. not walk down the red carpet anymore? And this is like once a red you've been carpet. to that live show mountaintop that we've been on, boys. I mean, with the, May, the moss, may it rest in peace. The moss hanging on the wall, people in a room. Yeah, wow. Ah, it's heady times, boys. We've uh, we've we've done some things together, and and including we've done what we always do on this program, uh, which is wander to and fro throughout the life of Ronald J. Martin. And until next time, the Happy Rant is brought to you by Resonate Recordings. If you go to ResonateRecordings.com, you can see the full range of services they offer. So if you're considering starting a podcast, they are the ones we recommend going with. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see their prices, to connect with them and ask any questions, and to see what they can do to help you launch, edit, master, and improve your podcast. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see what they can do to help you launch and improve your podcast.